guess what we're supposed to do with all the stuff that God's given us, all the talents and money and, and health and everything that God's given to us? What are we supposed to do with it? Give it back to him. Well, we are supposed to enjoy it. And that's part of the enjoyment of it. In this relationship with God that, and enjoying all that he has given to us, we give it back to him. Yes, that's why in our Mass we hear, you know, uh, the Searsum Corda, you know, it is, uh, it, is good, it is right and just. It is uh, truly right and just. Um, uh, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting it. I'm missing a state. Tell me it. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, that we should always and everywhere give thanks. Our duty and our salvation is giving thanks to God. Okay. Yes. And also giving back to God comes in different forms. Sure it does. Like, you know, helping the poor or spreading his words, because those are the things that please us. Yes. It's our time and our talent that we give back to him. Our time and our talent. That's what I know about Father Teresa Yes. Yes. And uh, you know, this one thing that they ask her one day is like, why it's so much for people in the world? And like, if it's the rich people, everybody is going to be where you are like, fucking, you know, be poor people. Be poor. Right. But unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, people that want like more and more materialistic, you know, that's what mm -hmm. it is. that's walking around. One of the articles in here talks about, in fact, I will bring it up because you bring up a very good point. I'm not going to go off on this, but I just want to make mention because you did too. But it says, no, the early Christians were not socialists. Okay? They were not. What they did was they gave so that no one went without. It's a different kind of mentality than what we understand today. And to understand the difference is to, uh, this would be a good place to start. But yes, what you're saying is out of the generosity of who has more gives to who's less. And as a result, everyone benefits. And this was one of the early uh, draws or pulls in the ancient world for the church because they did care for the widows and the orphans and the marginalized people. We're talking about in the Roman days, there wasn't social security. There wasn't welfare. If you were poor, you were destitute. If you were a woman, you were into prostitution if you did not have a, a husband because there was no anything for you. You had no social status, you couldn't vote, there was nothing like that for you. So you either had to be married or you had to be in a household. Otherwise, you end up in prostitution. Simple as that. There was no alternatives. The church offered those alternatives. So that women didn't have to be prostitutes because they cared for them in a way that no other pagan group did in the ancient world. And this drew people into the church because of the love that they showed one another. That was the earmark of the early church. They really cared for one another. And they showed it by the way that they cared for the, their women and orphans and widows and so forth. This is what, was the, what got the church's attention in a pagan world. And I'm telling you, my brothers and sisters, it's what's going to revive the church in the modern world. 
is when we get to see that star of love being the earmark of the church again. And the only way that's going to happen is if you and I start doing just that. That's how it begins. And I'm looking at the time, I'm not nearly going to get to what I wanted to. But um, let me try and get to as far as I can. Can I? Sure. All right. So, know your enemy, the tactics of temptation. One of the big things that we can learn from this story, and we definitely are going to come back here next week. I can guarantee you that. We may do this for two weeks. This is way too important to pass up. Okay? Know your enemy. What can we learn from this story? What are some of the tactics of the enemy in how he tempts us? First of all, he's not just the talk. Although I think this is a beautiful animal. Beautiful. It's beautiful. Green. I, love, I personally like snakes. I had one for a pet for many years. I think they're, they're, they're beautiful they're animals. Gorgeous, <laughs> <laughs> the first line of assault of the devil is this. To draw us away from God, the first thing is he sows a seed of doubt about God's law or precepts. Did God really say, don't eat of the fruit of the tree? And what was my answer? What should have been the answer? I will. Yes, that's exactly what he said. You got a problem with it, honey? Talk to God about it. I'm moving on. I've, had, I've spent enough time with you, Turkey. <laughs> and that would have been that. So the first line of defense is when you hear that, did God, are we really not supposed, uh, is it really a sin to, the answer is yes it is. So shut up. <laughs> I've got news for you. Uh, and we won't do this this week. I, 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 we'll do it next week. Uh, and I'll review this again. But when Jesus was tempted of the devil, this is the level at which the devil gets to him. That's the only level that he gets. He does not get to the other levels. You know why? Because Jesus never engaged him at that point. What do you mean? When the devil says to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, make these stones into brick. If you really are. You need to show me that you are. Are you sure you're the Son of God? Well, did Jesus know he was the Son of God? Did the devil know that he knew that he was the Son of God? Then what was he trying to, who was he trying to fool? Who was he trying to fool? And you know what, Jesus, he didn't even, he didn't even bother him. I'm not going to, what do you mean, if? Are you kidding me? I picture Jesus sort of laughing at him at that point. If I'm the son of, are you for real? I don't have to prove anything to you, chum. Right? And that's exactly how Jesus engaged him. I'm not falling for this if. The devil does it twice in the temptation. Read it on your own, Matthew 4, in, ahead, in advance. Read the temptation of Jesus, Matthew chapter 4. He does it twice, and you know what? Jesus never engages him. You know why? Because he's not being, he's not falling for it. We, on the other hand, well, you know, I'm not sure. Well, you know, it is such a beautiful, and well, mask can weigh, you know. You see what I mean? If we stop it here, it doesn't get to the point where we've committed a sin. Now, if that seed is planted, and for us it generally does, right? Right. Then the devil moves on to questioning God's character. Does he really have the best in mind for you? Or is he just some sort of big meanie up there? <laughs> Not just me. He's a killjoy, a party pooper. He just doesn't understand today's people. I mean, you know, a little booze, a little weed. I mean, come on. I mean, just all just relax a little. Come on. I mean, come on. No one's died from a little joy now. Right? 
God's just holding out on you anyway. He just doesn't like you to enjoy life. You know, this little affair is just between you and the secretary. Your wife doesn't have to know anything about it. <laughs> right? Right? Besides, she's made life so miserable at home, no wonder I'm sleeping with the secretary. Ah, now we're rationalizing it all, aren't we? See how easy sin sounds and all this? And how do I, where does this come from? See, the devil says in verse 5 of chapter 3, See, God knows on the day that you eat of it, you'll be like him. See, he's holding out on you. So just, just, just go for it, honey. You know? Have the affair. Have the joy. Don't go to mass. Keep your money. That homeless person is just going to use it on drugs anyway. Right? Besides, you need it more than they do. Oh, you can give it to the church collection on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that sounds good to you. Oh, I love that lie. Hmm? See what I mean? If that goes that far, then the devil will just slip, simply outright lie to you. He'll just outright lie to you. Oh, you're not going to die. Oh, you're not going to Good people like you don't go to hell for missing Mass one Sunday a year. Oh, come on. Please. You don't have to tell the priest everything in confession. You're not certainly going to tell him about the affair that you had. You know how this church gossips. Right? You're certainly not going to tell them about that, well, you know what, that you have on your computer that you watch. Hmm? Besides, who's going to know? Why do we need to even go to it? Why does the priest need to know your sins anyway? Why are we even going here? This is stupid. This is humiliating. Humiliation. Besides, I know this priest. And I know he's a big booze hound himself. So what? business does he have judging my life? You see these lies? <laughs> see, he just come. If you let the devil take an inch, he'll, get, he'll, he'll take a mile. And he just flat out lies to you at this point. So where do we stop this? Back up here. When, well, did God really? Yes, he did. Well, how do you know? Are you for sure? Well, I remember the Ten Commandments over here. Yes, honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. So I'm going to Mass. Got it? You have a problem with this? You take it up with the guy that wrote the book. <laughs> now you just go away, old scratch. Just go away. Leave me alone. Bother someone else who, who doesn't know better and is trying to live a holy life in love back to God. Won't last long, but at least you'll win some battles. Now just remember, being tempted is not a sin or sinful, or a sign of sinfulness. Jesus himself was tempted, and obviously never sinned. Okay. The difference between Jesus and us is that he didn't yield to the devil's lies and tactics. He overcame them. And next week is how we're going to find out how he did it so that we can do the same. I wanted to do it tonight, but it's already past nine. So may God bless and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.